about public defenders. I don't know yeah, I'll look, I'll look exactly louder. Exactly what you said about public defenders. What I said about public defenders is basically I believe that most of them are very good, very confident. You know, you have some that came from Ivy League schools, but they don't have the same resources. They don't have the same funding that someone in a private practice would have because in that case they have very wealthy clients and they basically have almost unlimited funding whereas a public defender is at the mercy of the, the, either the federal government if it's a federal crime or the state government which is even harder because states, some states don't have a lot of funding and with um, government shutdowns and like based actually back just in 2014 the federal um, defender budget was cut drastically and they don't have the same resources, they don't have the same access to experts, they don't have the same leeway, <coughs> and they don't have the same, I don't want to say dedication, they can't focus the same way that a private attorney would because they have more than one case to focus on. Most of the times they're overworked. Um, I understand the, the difference that you're trying to make between a public defender and one who's not, but at the end of the day, in the eyes of the law, this is that you're guilty based on what has been proven right. beyond a reasonable doubt. That is a fact. That is not, you can't change that regardless of how many resources that you have, fact, the money. But the 14th, the 14th Amendment doesn't just say that, you know, you have a, the 14th Amendment says you have equal protection under the law. Like, it doesn't just say, oh, you have protection under the law. And I think that key word is equal. My defense shouldn't be any different than your defense because I have the ability to pay. I should have just as vigorous of a defense as anybody else regardless of my ability to pay. But if being rich is, gives you a less chance of go going through the death penalty, of getting a conviction, that violates the 14th Amendment because we're not equal. We might both have protection, but it's not equal protection. If I could just add one thing. And uh, sort of pairing what Christina's been saying and to respond to you as well. Um, I've been a practicing attorney for over 35 years, all right? And for probably the first 15 years of my practice, all I did was criminal practice, all right? So I have uh, practiced criminal law in every, uh, you know, uh, court in New York State, all right, as well as the federal courts as well. And I am acquainted with uh, prosecutors on the federal level, the state level, as well as public defenders. And I can tell you emphatically from my own experience, all right, that the resources that the Suffolk County District Attorney's Office has, the Nassau County District Attorney's Office, the city, all right, um, they are so disproportionately larger. They are enormous as compared to the resources that are given to public defender's offices. And I can tell you right now, there's even a bigger distinction, all right, in disparity between the resources that the state has as opposed to private counsel. If I'm representing someone in a criminal case as private counsel, I basically am constrained by the resources that my client has. So they might be on that borderline where they can't afford a public uh, you know, uh, uh, prosecutor, okay? I'm sorry, a public defender. Um, so they have to go to a private counsel. But if they don't have the money, all right, for me to do a proper investigation, to hire investigators, all right, to go out and canvas, all right, witnesses and try to uncover other evidence, all right, they're going to be at a disadvantage. I'm going to be at a tremendous disadvantage in trying to defend my client, all right, against the power and the money and the resources, all right, of the prosecutor's office. So it's a major problem. A major problem. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, Justin, and then we'll go over here. I want to send you a voice. Right. So I'm just curious. So you're saying equal protection in the law. That's honorable. But how do you really accomplish that? Like, what are the guidelines to, you know, do that and allow people to be covered under the equal protection of the law? I'm not going to lie, I'm not sure, but I think that's something we need to figure out because it's a constitutional right. And it's true, a lot of things in the Constitution are hard to carry out. And I think that's something that we probably should focus on, but while we have something like the death penalty, you know, the old saying is, you can take somebody out of jail, you can't take them out from the grave. So while, yes, we, we do have a problem of inequality in this country, you know, we see it in, with the police force, we see it in our justice system, we see it in every aspect of our lives. So to me, that is definitely something that we need to work on. I don't know that I have a clear-cut answer, but I think the answer certainly isn't allowing a system that kills people to exist while we do have these clear inequalities. I don't think 
So I don't think the death penalty has any place in a society that has proven itself unable to create equality. Um, I have a little problem with your, your data on the racism. Um, one hand, you're saying that public defenders are not there to support the people. The other That's hand, not what saying, I said. No, you said that the regular attorneys are not as good as the public defenders represent them, That's correct? not what I said. As well-resourced. As well-resourced. Right. Okay, so that's a play on words. It's but not really a little how much is your data of your 12% and all these? I mean, when you're saying something about racism, how much of those 12% had public defenders? How much of them... You know, there's a 90%. lot of other stuff. Well, 90, 90. Okay, but well, why do they have 90%? Because why? they're lower economic. Okay, but yeah. you would have to find out why. Well, each I can tell you. Well, case well, is different. The majority, the, the fact of the matter, if I was, the capital crimes are so expensive. I'm upper middle class. If I was charged with a capital crime, I would need to use a public defender. I would. I might end up starting with like someone like Professor Regas, right. and then I'd probably end up running out of cash, and then I would be have to use a public defender. These are very, very expensive cases. So it's not just poor inner city people, it's even upper middle class people who sometimes end up having to use these public defenders. And I have nothing bad to say about public defenders. Like I said, that's the field that I want to go into. These are very high, highly qualified lawyers. The problem is they're subjected to the resources that the state or the federal government gives them. And it's just a matter of if you're wealthy, if you have money like O.J. Simpson or a football player or anyone else who gets charged with these crimes, you don't have to go through these avenues. You don't have to go through an already stressed system, so you're more likely to get a vigorous defense. That's my point. And when the Constitution says that we have equality, that we are all supposed to have a vigorous defense, but a public defender's office, because they have too many cases, can't give you the vigorous defense, I think that's a problem. Well, I didn't have a problem with the public defender and the regular attorney. I have a problem with the racism always being the same. That was my well, problem. I did, well, I mean, and like I, I said, I gave us. really see your data. There's well, I can tell you, I can show you my, my data, actually, if you want to look at it. I got, I, when I give data, I don't just use one source. I use the Innocence Project, I use Amnesty International, and I use UN. And they all said the same numbers. So I made sure that I didn't just find, like, yes, I agree. If I'm looking at either a left-wing or a right-wing site, it could be skewed. That's why I made sure I used at least three different source points. And I can, if you want to look at my data later, you can look at it. I will defer to Professor Regas on this. He knows this a little bit better. But this information is pretty settled within social science circles. People have studied this. Like, this is not a controversial claim. I mean, whether we're happy about it, we like that it's the case or not, uh, there's, uh, there's very little... Uh, Credible uh, sources that are disputing this as facts. What the facts mean, where they came from, what kind of implications we should draw, that's different. And again, uh, Professor Regas, please. No, you're Professor. absolutely on point. That's absolutely correct. Like, this, this is pretty much like, in the same way, like gravity is 9.8 meters per second squared. Like, the people who study this stuff aren't, aren't disputing this. Oh, let's go to Phil because he hasn't said anything yet, and then John. I feel that um, I understand what you're saying, definitely. Now, what do you feel about people who, uh, who might have, like, do you feel that we should put people into prison and then put their case away, or do you feel that there should always be there should be a department that always looks into these cases of people who've murdered to make sure that these are legitimate crimes? Because when you think about it, people who commit crimes and people who are convicted of them, they do have some form of defense in a uh, usually. So, is there a level of uh, should you think there should be a level of fervor, uh, fervor to try to find out if these people are generally convicted? I do. I definitely think there should definitely be appeals process. Um, not to go off on a tangent, but another problem I have with the death penalty is it often makes people plead guilty so that because they're afraid of getting the death penalty, and a lot of times the prosecutor will offer them a plea deal, but they have to sign away their right to appeal. And I think that's a huge problem because I think the appeals process is very needed. We have so many cases, especially with DNA where people have been in jail for 30, 40, 50 years, and then it's like, oh, oops, you were innocent. And if they got the death There's penalty, they'd already be dead. There's a lot of people that have been basically convicted by nothing but circumstantial evidence. There's a case in Oklahoma, Oklahoma, Oklahoma where um, his name's Richard Glossop. He was basically convicted and is on death row for a murder and the entire 
conviction came down to his accomplice, but that accomplice got a deal. So then the question is, when you have cases like this, and this is commonplace, this is stuff that happens. When you have cases where someone is convicted on circumstantial evidence, and that circumstantial evidence comes from a source that has a reason to play, place the blame on them, do you just close that case and shut it away and say that's it, or do you continue looking at it? So I, yes, I definitely think our appeals process is very needed, and I think that, again, I am obviously anti-death penalty. I feel like if we didn't have this death penalty, more attention could be focused on people serving life sentences or incredibly long sentences instead of having to worry about these appeals for you know these last minute stays of execution and all of this stuff. I think it hurts our justice system. I think it takes too much funding. I think it bleeds us dry. I want to give uh, John the last word here, although possibly response, because I want to make sure that everybody has equal time. Okay. You mentioned that DNA evidence looking has just, is, is, is now being used okay. the last couple of years. So today, if, if you saw if a criminal convicted, a, uh, committed a crime of murder, and he has a video showing it from a store across the street, and you have his DNA evidence, and you have the weapon, and he confessed, and he's convicted of murder. Would you allow him to be put to death as the state dictates? No, I wouldn't, because no. like I said, I think the death penalty violates the Eighth Amendment, and I think it violates the Fourteenth Amendment, and I think it's morally wrong. I think it's, I think it's, I think the fact that we're the only westernized, civil, civilized society that's still using it speaks volumes, and even, yes, there might be 0.1% of cases where there is no question of guilt. There's, in, there's video, there's DNA, there's not, whatnot. But I don't think you can legislate like that. I don't think you can say, oh, well, only there, if there's 100% proof, because that's a gray area. So I think it's one of those things where there's not enough 100% ability to find guilt where you can say we're put keeping the death penalty on the table. But doesn't the court system say, well, we, we really can't find, we think you did, you, maybe you did it, we'll, we'll give you life in prison, we're not going to give you the death penalty. Don't they like see if they should get the death penalty based on what happened during the court? Right. And if they go off another shadow of that, they're going to give the death penalty. But right. you're saying, no, we're not, we don't want to give the death penalty because it's not nice. They don't do it in I didn't Europe. say because it's not nice. I said, I the said four, that. Like, okay, well, I'm saying that the 14th Amendment does give us equal rights. And my whole argument is the fact that even in cases of 100% guilt, there's still racial discrepancies, there's still social economic discrepancies. I don't think you can have a punishment, the ultimate punishment, the taking of somebody's life, when you have a system that shows, even prosecutors who seek the death penalty, because the prosecutor doesn't have to seek the death penalty, there's even social economic and racial discrepancy in the DA's decision to seek the death penalty. And I think when you have a punishment like that, that isn't used in a clear-cut way that's used basically at the whim of a DA office or a prosecutor and there's no, like I said, there's no standard. There really isn't a standard. They can choose to use it or choose not to use it. I don't think that a system like that has any place in our government. I, I think it's cruel. I think it's barbaric. And like I said, I do think it's inherently racist and like, not just against a certain ethnicity. I think it punishes the poor. So. I don't know if that answers your question. I know you don't agree with me, but that's where I stand. Okay, I want to. We're going to. We saw half of our panel to go, but I do want to. I lied. I want to give Dr. Uh, Professor Reese the last word. Um, John, just to respond to your query, look at me. <laughs> <laughs> right. With regard 